Live from Beacon Hill, my name is Emilio Madrigal. Today is Friday, August 28th, 2020, and I am joined remotely by my good friend and colleague, Rifat Manan, who is at UPenn in Philly. Today, we continue the GYN and OB PathCast series by hosting for the first time, Dr. Vanda Torres, who is an assistant professor of pathology at Harvard Medical School and one of my cytopathology colleagues at the Mass General Hospital right here in Boston. The title of her talk is Products of Conception, What Not to Miss. As always, please feel free to post questions and comments in the Facebook and YouTube chat windows, and we'll make sure to pass them along at the end of the session. So with that short intro, I will now turn the microphone over to Dr. Torres. Thanks, Emilio. Um, and I'd really like to first thank those at PathCast for inviting me to give this talk. Um, which hopefully people will enjoy <laughs> and find to be a practical overview. Um, so my name is Vonda Torres and I'm a cytopathologist and surgical pathologist specializing in OB pathology at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, I'm also the QA director of our cytopathology laboratory and have a special interest in both quality improvement um, as well as med medical education. So with that, here's an outline for my talk. Um, I a subject area that is somewhat hard for people um, to conceptualize, mostly because it's most unlike anything else in anatomic pathology. We'll start with some basic introduction, including what are the benefits to examining these specimens. Um, We'll briefly go through early development because that's really how we can start to understand why and what we are seeing. Um, so disclaimer, there will be some embryology in this talk. Um, then we'll get more into the gross and microscopic findings before getting more into the nitty gritty of spontaneous abortions themselves. So why do we examine products of conception? This is actually a more complicated question than what may be presented at face value. And it depends on a number of different factors, including the clinical scenario and the gestational age. Um, but we can break it down into some main goals. So for early pregnancy loss, which we can define as that occurring before 14 weeks gestation or first trimester losses, um, pathologic examination may or may not clue in on an exact cause for the demise, but it's important for several reasons. This includes to confirm that the patient has actually been pregnant, um, also to confirm that the pregnancy has been intrauterine, um, i.e. to exclude an ectopic pregnancy. Um, we also want to exclude gestational trophoblastic disease, which would include molar pregnancies. Um, and also, if applicable, this is our chance to secure um, material for genetic testing. For late pre-viable pregnancy loss, um, which we can define as between 14 and 24 weeks gestation, um, we can think about it in a few ways. Broadly speaking, we want to document fetal anomalies if present and suggest or identify the underlying fetal disorder if present. If there are no fetal anomalies present, then we try to identify the reason for the loss. And this may be intrinsic to the fetus itself or extrinsic, such as due to factors involving the intrauterine environment. Now, late pre-viable pregnancy losses are due to a variety of reasons, um, which tend to overlap with the flanking trimesters depending on the gestational age, um, but they tend to overlap more with premature births. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm really going to focus um, more on early pregnancy loss. Early pregnancy loss itself is relatively common. About 15% of all clinically recognized pregnancies result in pregnancy loss. Now, the total incidence among all conceptions is estimated to be much higher. Um, these are ones before the woman even is aware that she's pregnant. Um, there have been some interesting studies um, that have tried to estimate this, um, including one based on a mathematical formula and another one based on high sensitivity beta HCG assays. Um, other studies have yielded more conservative values, but it is estimated that more than half of all pregnancies 
actually result in early loss. So let's briefly review early development in order to put things in context and to start to understand what we are seeing a bit more. So starting at the very beginning, <laughs> in the day after ovulation, the oocyte is fertilized near the distal end of the fallopian tube. Um, it undergoes cellular divisions as it travels down the fallopian tube, forming the 16 cell morula, which then undergoes cavitation to form a centrally cystic blastocyst that enters the uterine cavity and implants into the superficial endometrium at about nine to 12 days post conception. The blastocyst stage is when the first linear segregation occurs. The main components are the inner cell mass, the outer trophoblast, and the blastocyst cavity. Now the inner cell mass will give rise to all of the embryonic structures and some of the extra embryonic structures, um, which include the embryo, yolk sac, amnion, and umbilical cord. As you can see in this diagram here, um, it first transforms into a bilayered and then trilayered embryonic disc which is contiguous with the two cystic structures, the amniotic cavity and the yolk sac. Now, the outer layer of cells forms the trophoectoderm, which is the trophoblast precursor, and which will give rise to the placenta and chorionic membrane. Now, in speaking a bit more about the trophoblast shell, um, it is the polar um, trophoectoderm, the cells that are the nearest to the inner cell mass that is responsible for attachment to the endometrium and invasion um, of the blastocyst into the uterine lining. Once the blastocyst has attached to and invaded into the uterine lining, it is followed by rapid expansion of the trophoectoderm. It consists of an inner actively proliferating uh, cytotrophoblast layer which functions as a primordial trophoblast and an outer mitotically inactive syncytia trophoblast layer, which is termed the primitive syncytium. Then syncytia trophoblast degrade the surrounding tissue and tap into the maternal sinusoids. Um, the primitive syncytium forms cytoplasmic lacunae, which expand and coalesce, eventually becoming the maternal intervillous space. Now the cytotrophoblasts proliferate and invaginate forming primary villi. Primitive connective tissue forms adjacent to the proliferating cytotrophoblasts with mesenchymal cells invading into the primary villus structures forming secondary villi. This is a gross image from a dissecting microscope showing an early gestational sac where it's still evenly covered by chorionic villi circumferentially. Um, eventually, some of these villi will regress and become the avillus embryonic, uh, the avillus chorionic membrane, or what we call the chorion levae. And as a fun fact, um, you can see those remnants and membranes of mature placentas. Now, the other perfused chorionic villi will then continue to proliferate and eventually form the parenchyma of the placental disc. So what are we looking for? Well, what we're looking for depends a bit on the clinical scenario and can be divided into three specimen categories, including um, spontaneous abortions, therapeutic abortions, and rule out ectopics. If we focus on spontaneous abortions, the, abor the approach will depend on the gestational age and method of evacuation. You basically want to look for and identify um, things like fetal parts, villi or placental tissues, and decidua if present. How much tissue you submit will depend on various factors and may vary depending on your institution to some degree. Again, you want to keep in mind that you want to confirm that there was indeed an intrauterine pregnancy and to rule out other things such as trophoblastic disease. You also want to determine if you need genetic studies, for instance, if an anomaly or molar pregnancy is suspected. Here are just some general tips that I wanted to include um, for gross ex examination of these specimens. 
Examining the tissue in a Petri dish and passing saline may help in identifying chorionic villi. Also, chorionic villi tend to expand and float um, in saline, while decidua is more dense and tends to settle to the bottom of the dish. Um, decidual tissue also has a smooth appearance that under the dissecting microscope <clears throat> appears punctu um, punctated due to penetrating decidual vessels. So dissecting mic microscopes can be helpful if you have them available to you. Also, you may get specimens that appear to be mainly blood clot and they may not appear promising at first. However, careful gross examination and processing is key in these cases. Um, it may help to focus on the central clotted areas of these cases where some gestational tissue may be identified. These are just some examples of what you may see um, grossly. You may get intact or disrupted chorionic sacs. Um, now on the right side, this is a case um, where you can see, um, especially after floating the material in saline, how abnormal the villi look. This was actually from a complete molar pregnancy. So floating the, um, floating the specimen in saline can be really helpful um, to both identify and accentuate certain features. Um, and I also wanna take a moment at this point to thank our amazing PA, um, Cara, for this wonderful gross image. Um, our PAs are really instrumental to our practice and to teaching. So I really just wanted to thank her for providing this image. So now in terms of microscopic examination, these are the constituents of products of conception and ones that we mention in our reports. Um, these include chorionic villi, placental implantation site, decidua, and endometrium. Now myometrium is not maybe a quote unquote normal constituent per se. Um, it may be seen for instance, if the DNC procedure is perhaps on a little bit more of the aggressive side, um, it may have, it, it may or may not have implications in future pregnancies. Um, for instance, if subsequent uterine scarring occurs. Um, so it's something to mention if you see it, um, but not necessarily something that would be quantified per se. Also of note, area stella reaction and endometrial decidualization may occur secondary to exogenous or pathologically endogenous progestins. And also they don't distinguish between intrauterine and extrauterine pregnancy. So really the presence of fetal parts, um, chorionic villi and or implantation site are the only things that reliably can rule out an ectopic pregnancy. And of course there'll be some exceptionally rare caveats to that. So to speak a bit more on some of these, here's, here we see an example of immature chorionic villi. Um, which are the functional units of the placenta. As seen here, they have two trophoblast layers, the inner cytotrophoblast layer and the outer syncytotrophoblast layer. The other constituents include fetal capillaries, mesenchymal cells, and fetal macrophages, what we call Hofbauer cells. Now, something to note is that there are changes associated with fetal death, including cellular debris within villus vessels, villus edema and myxoid degeneration, what we can refer to as villus hydrops, um, and villus fibrosis or sclerosis. So the chorionic villi may take on a variety of looks depending on these changes, and that's something to keep in mind. Also, by way of comparison, um, immature chorionic villi look different than mature uh, villi. Eventually, in the maturation process, what happens is the cytotrophoblast layer diminishes and becomes discontinuous. They're, so they are largely inconspicuous and you may only see scattered cytotrophoblasts in mature villi. Um, and you can maybe see a few of those here. The majority of the mature chorionic villus is covered by syncytotrophoblasts. These will undergo apoptosis as they mature and form the syncytotrophoblast knots, oops, which you can see here. Other notable features of more mature villi as compared to immature villi is that they are smaller in size, less cellular, and the fetal capillaries are noted peripherally rather than more centrally as, compar as compared to the immature villi. 
So you can sort of see that in this example where they're more peripherally situated. Also to note, um, mature villi will predominate after 37 weeks, um, although this is affected by different conditions, um, such as those that lead to placental ischemia, um, including preeclampsia and chronic hypertension. The implantation site changes that we see are basically at the fetal maternal interface where the cytotrophoblasts from the anchoring villi extend and eventually differentiate into extravillous trophoblasts. These either per permeate the endometrium as interstitial extravillous trophoblasts or remodel maternal vessels as endovascular trophoblasts. The endovascular trophoblasts will initially plug the maternal spiral arterioles and then start to migrate and line the vessels, actually replacing the maternal endothelium. This is what allows for the transformation of the maternal spiral arterioles to vessels that become more dilated so as to divert more than maternal cardiac output to the intervillous maternal space, um, which is a process that we call physiologic conversion. Here's a higher magnification. Um, now, these cells are relatively larger than cytotrophoblasts and syncytotrophoblasts, usually are mononuclear but can be multinucleated, have relatively larger nuclei that may have a smudge nuclear chromatin with some angulation to the nuclei and have eosinophilic cytoplasm. <laughs> so again, I'm a cytopathologist, so I had to fit the word chromatin at least once into my talk or else I would lose my credentials. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> So now I just wanted to briefly go over some pitfalls and mimics. Um, so there are some mimics of chorionic villi and implantation site to be aware of, especially if you're considering um, possibly an ectopic pregnancy. One which I've shown here is that aggregates of fibrin may superficially take on an appearance of villi. So it's important to go on higher magnification if you suspect that. Um, other notable pitfalls and mimics include endocervical tissue, which may take on a pseudovillous appearance, mature chorionic villi residual from a prior pregnancy, or an implantation site nodule from a prior pregnancy. Now, what about cases where you only get scattered syncytotrophoblasts? So these confirm pregnancy, but they don't actually confirm the location of the pregnancy. They could theoretically be quote unquote, falling from a tubal gestation into the uterus, they also don't signify if the pregnancy has been totally evacuated. So this is an example of how we cite out these cases, um, basically in consideration of those caveats. The clinicians will have to correlate with the clinical picture. Um, for instance, if a lot of tissue was passed um, by the patient prior to them presenting at the hospital. So now let's look more in depth at pregnancy loss. So again, early spontaneous pregnancy loss is that occurring before 14 weeks gestation. Um, it can really be divided a number of different ways, um, but a key categorization is sporadic versus recurrent loss. Now the vast majority, greater than 95% are sporadic. Karyotypic abnormalities are the most common known mechanism, um, accounting for an estimated 50 to 70% of pregnancy losses. And that's actually quite high, especially considering that studies have shown that only about 5% of elective early terminations have karyotypic abnormalities. It's also the presumptive cause of most other early losses, presumably due to small deletions or rearrangements that are undetectable by standard karyotyping or microarray testing. Now, there are varied reasons for loss in pregnancies with normal karyotype. Um, this would include things like non-chromosomal anomalies, exposure to teratogens, um, et cetera. Um, really, only relatively rarely do you see histopathologic evidence of a, um, of a specific underlying cause, but it's important to consider them such as lymphoplasmocytic chronic villitis, um, which may signify a viral infection like CMV or, nu or nucleated red cells with parvovirus inclusion. 
And we'll also speak on a few more additional ones when we talk about ca um, causes of recurrent pregnancy loss. If we look um, into early pregnancy losses with abnormal karyotypes, um, these are due to a number of different abnormalities um, with lethal, lethal trisomies being the most common, estimate about 30%, then monosomy X at about 10% and triploidy. Trisomy 16 is the most common autosomal trisomy detected in abortuses, um, but trisomies of most nearly all chromosomes have been documented. Most of these karyotypic abnormalities are sporadic, and only four to six percent are due to parental germline abnormalities, such as a balanced reciprocal translocation. Also, of note, um, karyotypic abnormalities are relatively more frequently identified in earlier gestational ages, um, affecting about seventy percent in those less than six weeks gestational age, declining to less than 20% in those greater than 10 weeks gestational age. So what about clinical features? Um, so clinicians are able to follow pregnancies and assess for things like vi um, viability based on a number of different factors, um, which include um, HCG levels, ultrasound findings, including the timing of the appearance of different structures and the rate of growth of structures, including the gestational sac, um, which should be seen at about four and a half to five weeks, the yolk sac, which should be visible at five and a half to six weeks, and an embryo with cardiac activity, which should be detectable shortly after the yolk sac. There have been some clinical features that have been indicated to point to pregnancy loss with abnormal karyotypes specifically, um, including one study that pointed to a yolk sac larger than five millimeters. However, all of these are relatively nonspecific, and some studies have shown no associations between abnormal karyotype and ultrasound findings in early miscarriage cases. Now, unfortunately, information on the karyotype of an abortus is usually not available. Um, routine karyotyping is expensive and may not be high yield on abortus material as the tissue may fail to grow or may have significant contamination with maternal cells. So then the question arises, are there histologic findings that are specific for abnormal karyotype? Well, the short answer is yes, but there are some caveats. And first off, we can have abnormal karyotypes with dysmorphic features and we could have uh, without dysmorphic features, um, and we can have them with dysmorphic features. So let's take a closer look um, first at those without dysmorphic features. So the majority of early pregnancy losses with abnormal karyotype actually do not demonstrate any specific microscopic abnormalities. And this is on the order of 80% of cases. Grossly, you may see an intact chorionic sac um, without a fetus or with a dysmorphic or small for gestational age fetus. It's rare to see any specific or recognizable malformations um, at this stage. Microscopically, you may see uniformly hydropic villi due to the distal villi lacking any fetal vessels resulting in hydropic degeneration, or you may see secondary involutional changes with poorly vascularized, partially hyalinized hydropic villi. However, the microscopic findings do not have a high pos um, positive predictive value, which limits the clinical utility. So what about cases with abnormal karyotypes that do have dysmorphic features? Well, only a minority of cases, less than 20% um, with abnormal karyotypes will actually show dysmorphic histopathologic features. So there's a low negative productive value just to begin with. However, despite this, most studies have shown that the finding of two or more dysmorphic features is relatively specific for an abnormal karyotype and has a high positive predictive value on the order of 90%, at least according to one study. <clears throat> you can already think of one scenario, i.e. partial moles, where the histologic features have been well documented. <clears throat> Karyistic um, dysmorphic uh, 
features have also been proposed for other non-molar aneuploidy gestations, although these have been less reproducible. An early study pointed to some features suggesting certain karyotypic findings um, although studies since then have shown these criteria to be neither specific nor sensitive for specific chromosomally abnormal spontaneous abortions, um, there are some features that we can look for. And so here's just a list um, of dysmorphic features, which in addition to villus enlargement have been shown to be associated with abnormal karyotypes. These include irregular villus contours, trophoblast inclusions, villus stromal cells with nuclear karyomegaly, abnormal vascular patterns, villus cisterns, and villus trophoblast hyperplasia. I'm going to show some examples of these features on the following slides. Um, and just as a note, these images are all from cases that were shown to have aneuploidy by chromosomal analysis and were not molar pregnancies. So irregular villus contours, um, this includes scalping and um, fjord-like invaginations. It has been described by some as an irregular, irregular look, and you can see why. Trophoblast inclusions are epithelial inclusions within the villus stroma and represent increased proliferative rate of the inner cytotrophoblast um, relative to the outer centrophoblast cent layer. Some of these may represent a tangential sectioning of the villi with irregular contours, but most of them are true inclusions. And here's just another example where you can more prominently see that. Here's an example of villus stromal cells with nuclear karyomegaly, where the cells show a two to three fold nuclear enlargement compared to the normal adjacent stromal cell nuclei. You can also see an abnormal vascular pattern um, with perpendicular maze-like or chicken wire capillary branching. <clears throat> it can also manifest as other abnormal patterns such as dilated venous sinusoids. Now villus cisterns represent a clearing of stromal cells from the central part of the hydropic villi um, and developing as villi become enlarged in cystic. So villus trophoblast hyperplasia, um, this, is, this can take on a variety of looks. Um, here's an example where you can see abnormal syncytial trophoblast sprouts projecting into the um, inner villus space. You can see that here. Here's just another example where it was more prominently seen. You can also get more abundant and thickened syncytial trophoblasts that extend into the intervillous space. They can form complex papillary or microcystic appearing trophoblastic proliferations. So again, these features are not predictive of a specific karyotype, but two or more of these features may suggest gestational aneuploidy. Now, if you start getting three or more features, start thinking about partial molar pregnancies. Um, however, there's considerable histopathologic variability that exists among spontaneous abortions with identical karyotypes, um, including triploidy molar versus non-molar, and in those with um, different karyotypes, such as normal versus lethal trisomies. All in all, these features are not reliable are not reliable enough to develop histologic criteria for accurate pathologic cytogenetic diagnoses and thus to guide genetic counseling. And here's a case that really drives home some of these points, um, a real life case. Um, this case had basically all of the features that make you worried about a partial molar pregnancy. This hygienics was ordered up front, which of course takes a couple of weeks to return. And this case was actually eventually found to be trisomy 21. So there can be a lot of overlap between different chromosomal aberrancies and molar pregnancies. And it's just something to be aware of and consider because it's not always so straightforward as you can imagine. 
So now to switch gears a little bit, um, recurrent pregnancy loss is defined as something or as is defined as three or more spontaneous losses in the first and or second trimesters. These can be due to a number of different factors, um, some which are listed here, um, which can be placed into different general buckets. Genetic aberrations are again a consideration. Now, in terms of triaging specimens, the odds of having three spontaneous abortions by chance alone has been calculated as 0.3%. So these are ones that if they don't come to us with a request for genetic testing, we do try to contact the clinical team to confirm that indeed they do or don't want the testing to be performed in order just to ensure that things don't slip through the cracks um, in case a possible genetic mechanism for the recurrent loss is under consideration. Again, histologic findings indicating a specific etiology are more rarely identified. And here are some examples of some of these, which include chronic histiocytic intervillicitis, massive perivillous fibrin deposition, and others, including lymphoplasmacytic deciduitis and chronic velitis. I just want to draw your attention to this nice study by Redline and colleagues, which really drove home um, some of these points that histologic features in specimens from losses with normal karyotype um, included um, chronic intervillicitis increased perivillous fibrin deposition, um, decidual plasma cells and deciduitis, and chronic velitis. So these are things, again, just to keep in mind and to look for. So if we start to look more in depth on some of these different things, um, so chronic histiocytic intervillicitis, um, this is an uncommon but, un uh, but important cause of recurrent spontaneous pregnancy loss. Um, which affects less than 5% of early pregnancy losses overall, but about a third of chromosomally normal recurrent miscarriages, at least according to the Redline article seen on the prior slide. It's relatively more commonly seen in early pregnancy losses, um, but, can seen, but can be seen at any gestational age. And it's characterized by a diffuse infiltration of intervillous space by CD68 positive maternal uh, monocyte macrophages. Um, and by definition, it's not accompanied by a chronic velitis. There can be a variable amount of perivillous fibrin seen in these cases um, as well. So that's something to keep in mind. At least according to one study by Drs. Boyd and Redline, specifically on chronic histiocytic intervillicitis, um, it was seen to recur in about two thirds of patients. And this diagnosis is important not only because of the risk of recurrence, but also the risk of fetal morbidity and mortality. While the exact cause is unknown, um, it has been found to have a strong association with maternal autoantibodies or autoimmune disease. Massive perivillous fibrin deposition is another one. Um, so this can uh, again occur at really any gestational age. Um, it's an effacement of the intervillous space by fibrinoid material that envol um, envelops the cro uh, chorionic villi. It can be somewhat challenging to diagnose these in early pregnancies, especially um, for a number of different reasons. One is that prostaglandin or mesoprostol administration can also cause deposition of fibrinoid material. Additionally, you could get focal areas of fibrin deposition just normally or larger areas if there's been um, retention of products of conception. So adding a note, at least raising it as a differential may be helpful in challenging cases. Um, particularly in patients with recurrent pregnancy losses. <clears throat> Lymphoplasmacytic deciduitis um, and chronic endometriitis. So the, the presence of plasma cells either in the endometrium of non-pregnant women or in the decidua of pregnant women always indicates an in inappropriate local antigen stimulation for whatever reason, um, or I should say a number of different reasons. Um, it's been 
found at least in association with anywhere between 10 to 30% of spontaneous abortions overall. Histologically, um, it can be seen associated as well with chronic velitis or cor um, chronic chorioamnionitis. Studies have shown it to be associated with issues regarding very different things, including implantation, recurrent pregnancy losses, and fetal demise. So it's important to note this um, if you see it. So this has been a whirlwind introduction to products of conception. In summary, I hope that I've shown you a few different things. Um, one, and especially a thorough gross and microscopic examination is important in products of conception. It's important to recognize the range of features that, be can, that can be seen normally and in abnormal cases, including those that are cared typically abnormal. While microscopic findings pointing to a specific cause of pregnancy loss are relatively rare, there are some distinct processes to be aware of. Um, particularly since some of these portend a chance for recurrence, as well as increased fetal morbidity and mortality. So with that, I'll leave you with my references. I want to draw um, special attention to the top two, which are textbooks, uh, especially the first one, um, which is a relatively new textbook um, by Redline, Boyd, and Roberts. Um, it's called Placental and Gestational Pathology, um, which just came out a couple of years ago. Um, it's excellent for both, um, um, for all sort of OB related topics, both um, it's it's called placental and, and the placenta. Um, so if you want additional reading, that's a good place to start. Um, the Crum Nucci et al. book, I'm sure a lot of us or most of us have on our shelves as well. And that has great chapters on OB pathology as well. So with that, thank you. And I think that we um, can open it up to questions if there are some as well. Thanks again. Awesome, thank you so much, Vanda. So I do have a couple of questions that I'm seeing here. And uh, so let me see, let me look through YouTube first. Um, okay, so there's a question from Harshit Bajpi. It says, what is the difference between a sensational knot and knuckles? Um, I'm not aware of any sort of difference to me. I haven't, I haven't personally heard the word knuckles before. So the knots are just sort of those like little nubs that you see on the chorionic villi. Um, so, so they may be that they're the same thing. Okay. Then I have another question here. It says, any management options uh, available to prevent recurrent pregnancy loss if we report chronic, chronic intervillicitis? So chronic intervillicitis. So unfortunately, sometimes, um, or a lot of times, this is sort of more like an autoimmune, autoimmune type response. Um, so it depends. So if you're seeing plasma cells, so uh, lymphoplasmacytic velitis, that may be due to things like more viral sort of things. So that's something to look out for. But chronic intervillus, um, uh, like VUE, villus, um, villus, uh, velitis of unknown etiology, you know, is unknown. So unfortunately, I, I'm not aware of specific treatments. It can actually even get worse in subsequent pregnancies. Um, so it's something to note in your reports. Um, and they, it may just be that they watch them a little bit closer in subsequent pregnancies. But no specific treatments as far as I'm aware of. Okay. I have another question here from uh, Celso Silva. And the question says, uh, what about the endometrial mucosa in the curatage material and the functional aspect of the histology? If you can comment on that. Yeah, so I didn't get too much into that. Um, so the endometrium itself, um, we comment on it, but um, honestly, so that, that probably has more to do with other things as well. So usually it'll be like a secretory, hypersecretory sort of appearance to it as well. If you're getting recurrent losses, it may be also important to point those 
the features out as well um, because it could be due to a variety of reasons. Okay. I know you didn't get too much into moles, but if you want to take a stab at this question, <clears throat> it's just it's from Alan Reed from uh, it's on Facebook. It says, "How would you differentiate changes due to aneuploidy like hyper uh, hyperplasia in cisterns from early complete hydatiform mole?" Yeah, <laughs> so I didn't get into moles too much because I think it's going to be in a separate pathcast talk. Um, so I didn't want to <laughs> take any sort of uh, of the thunder away from anybody else. Um, but this is a very challenging area um, in pro in sort of OB pathology, um, to say the least. So there can be a lot of different overlap, which I think that maybe I conveyed to you on some of the images. Um, and again, a lot of these histologic features can overlap. So there's some things that can help us. Um, one would be an immune stain for um, P57. So you can try um, performing that as well. Um, but otherwise, a lot of a lot of it will just overlap um, histologically. Okay, perfect. I see one more question here. It's on Facebook. And the question is, uh, in the absence of genetic testing, should it be more appropriate to state a diagnosis as suggestions, such as hydropic villi suggestive of partial mole to be correlated with ACG level, for example? Yes, exactly. I would, I would totally agree with that. So again, because of the overlap, none of these are entirely specific for anything. Um, and just because of the overlap, you don't want to miss a partial mole, but you also can't necessarily, if you don't have cytogenetics, like if it wasn't taken up front, if you don't have enough, um, then uh, the most you can do sometimes is just suggest that in your report. And that in itself, I think is pretty helpful to the clinicians as well, because they can follow the HCG either with even just a single follow-up HCG can mm -hmm. be helpful to them um, just to exclude sort of different things. Um, so I think just suggesting it in, um, in reports um, could be helpful. Um, again, because of the overlap, it's just really hard to tell, you know, is it a partial mole versus an aneuploidy case without that genetic testing? Right, right. Okay, those are the questions that I can see right now. Um, you know, if, if uh, some folks out there have any more questions, I know Vanda's on Twitter, and you can post the questions on, <clears throat> on the Twitter post that we created for this, for this talk. Uh, uh, we've tagged Vanda in, the, in, that, in that post. It's Van, Vanda Torres MD. So you can comment to Dr. Torres and post any questions that you may have. Um, as a follow-up, and I'm sure it would be all right for, for you to communicate with, with Dr. Torres on Twitter. Um, so thank you so much again, uh, Vanda, for this uh, wonderful presentation on progress of conception. I know this is a very challenging area for, for many practicing pathologists, and you know, I think this lecture will be very helpful for them um, in their practice. You'll be happy to know that, I mean, you had hundreds and hundreds of viewers from around the world. Um, some of the comments that we that that were posted on Facebook and YouTube um, where some folks were mentioning where they were from and expressing their gratitude for your lecture. Um, just to name a few, I see here Singapore, uh, Egypt, Algeria, Iran, uh, Iraq, Nepal, Chad, Tanzania, um, Colombia, Malaysia, Algeria, and you know there's a bunch more and you, you can see them in the YouTube and Facebook uh, chat once you're once we're done here if you'd like. But um, very well received lecture. So thank you very much again. Um, so with that, we'll conclude today's session. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you everybody.